Hi, everyone. My name is Faith Taylor, and I will be your moderator for today's session um, entitled, sorry, just give me one second, entitled Intersectional Environmental Justice, Environmental Racism, Incarceration, and Toxic Prisons in the United States. So I'm very excited to be your moderator today. I'm very excited for our session. I think it's going to be very fruitful, informational, and just all around absolutely amazing. Um, all right, so let me see if all of our panelists are here and then we can get started. And then we'll just give an extra minute or two for the remaining panelists, and then we'll go ahead and get, get going. Okay, great. Hello, hello, we're all here. So let's just dive right into our discussion. And first, I just want to thank you all for coming today to be part of this discussion, part of this panel, um, and a part of the overall symposia. Um, and we're here in this session to discuss the critical intersection of race, incarceration, and environmental justice. So let's start off with some introductions. And if you could just start off by telling us how you've entered this area of space in activism and what have you focused on? And then we'll start with uh, Dr. Pello first. All right, thanks so much for uh, having me here. Really great to see everybody. I'm bringing you greetings from unceded traditional indigenous Chumash territory, also known as Santa Barbara. California. I got involved in this, I guess, with three influences. One was my parents, uh, who were both civil rights movement activists, deeply involved with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and they instilled a deep thirst and a hunger in me for justice. A second influence would be, of course, the environmental justice movement, and I'm uh, fortunate to have worked for Hazel Johnson, the executive director of People for Community Recovery, an environmental justice organization on the south side of Chicago. Hazel is known as the Black Mother of the Environmental Movement, and may she rest in peace. 
I, um, I guess I'd say my third influence come from BIPOC revolutionary movements and anarchist revolutionary movements, including uh, Puerto Rican independentistas, Black Liberation Army, Black Panther folks, anarchists, and other folks who um, really pushed me to understand the, the value of collective freedom movements historically and, and currently, and how we need each other to, to make change, and that there will always be state repression. And when there is state repression, you know you're doing something right. So. Um, what I've been focusing on is much of not only documenting environmental injustices in carceral spaces, but also documenting the fact that some of the most inspiring leaders in the environmental justice movement today globally are people who are themselves incarcerated, who are documenting these problems, who are articulating um, the, uh, the scourge of environmental and climate injustices in prisons and who are articulating visions of radical freedom. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Fellow. And to Delegate Terry Hill, if you could respond as well. Good morning, good afternoon, actually. Uh, um, so, um, wow. I, I am, uh, as, as you said, I'm, I'm a physician and I really look at policy through a healthcare lens um, when I think about social justice, environmental justice, um, economic justice, and uh, criminal justice, I think that they are, you know, um, linked in ways that cannot be separated. And that when we, or when I look at policy solutions to the problems that we're dealing with, um, it, it is clear that everything comes back to what is in the uh, best interest of our health as a society. And when we talk about those issues that I mentioned, um, we're really talking about uh, making it a better uh, world for all of us. And criminal justice particularly is where um, the worst sins that we have committed in terms of failed policy are clearly seen. And um, so for me, it is difficult to separate. And so I'm really passionate about trying to move us forward on all of those areas and that and believe that we have to move forward in parallel um, in all areas, that there is no prioritization of one over the other. Thank you for that response, uh, Dr. Jason Williams. Hi, yes, thank, thank you for having me here as well. Um, I suppose it has a lot to do with uh, my upbringing, coming up in a housing project and, and, and having to live in the, as I call it, the undercarriage of America, you know, um, next to a highway, most of us have asthma, um, you know, and living with all of those health abnormalities, um, but also the prison ecology of sorts. Um, Again, being a critical race criminologist, I've always been attracted to sort of unpacking the various intersections that are um, that are often uh, attacked and affected by mass incarceration. Um, for me, it is very important to uh, foreground lived experiences in my home discipline, in particular criminology and criminal justice. It is hyper quantitative, and so we don't, you know, really care to, um, you know, to look towards the qualitative variety. So. What I like to do is get into those trenches and to speak to those who are directly affected by these atrocities. So that, that's what a lot of my academic work does. It, it, it purposely looks to foreground qualitative uh, methodologies and pursuits of looking at the context, the, the thick description, as we often like to say, and to sort of unpack the uh, the dangers of the prison and, and, you know, what does it mean to be inside the prison? How does those dangers linger beyond the walls uh, and, and perhaps into these people's families and communities and et cetera? So that, that's my community work for the most part. And, and, and similarly to the um, doctor on, on any number of topics, um, not just the prison, um, but then also my community organizing work as well is towards trying to push um, policy change. And, and that's something that I do here in New Jersey with a variety of organizations as well. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And I forgot to mention this. Um, we will have time for questions at the end. So if you have questions for our speaker, just go ahead and type them into the chat at the end or wow, and we'll address them at the end. And then um, Mai Azam. 
Hi, um, my name is May. You can use any pronouns to refer to me. Um, before I introduce myself, I want to introduce the land that I'm calling from. This is Squaxin territories and the land that I'm on specifically is still stewarded by indigenous people. And um, I don't make this land acknowledgement as a formality, but because um, I believe that decolonization is inseparable from prison abolition and from environmental justice. We can't have environmental justice without returning land to indigenous people. So I just want to ground us in that before I introduce myself. Um, but yeah, my name is May. How I, how I came to this area, I would say the roots um, of that is through personal experience with law enforcement as a youth, um, just my encounters and relationships that I've built since then with folks who are currently informally incarcerated. Um, when I was in college, I was really deep into labor organizing and environmental organizing, and I was doing these as separate things and not really considering the intersections of those and like the relationship of like my own experiences with law enforcement and um, the people I knew who were incarcerated until those links were kind of made of how like, oh, like incarcerated people make up a huge under-recognized and exploited labor force. And they're also on the front lines of such environmental toxicity um, and trauma, and they're not included in, in either of those fields. And so I kind of, the past three years or so have just been directing my focus on that, that intersection. Um, and yeah, I think it's important also for me to be transparent that I, I don't consider myself formerly incarcerated. And so I'm not here to speak on behalf of anyone. Um, I'm here in solidarity to just, yeah, speak the observations that I've learned from folks. And um, my focus has been mostly on direct support for people who are currently incarcerated and really taking the lead from folks through mail correspondence to see like, what are the issues that they're dealing with? How can we draw attention to them? Um, most specifically this season, we've been focusing on um, preparing for hurricanes. And so um, getting folks evacuated during hurricane season, making sure that our loved ones behind bars are not left behind in disaster situations. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Uh, and then Paul Wright. Hi, thanks for inviting me to, uh, to join everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Wright and I came to this work by uh, going to prison. So that was uh, my introduction <laughs> uh, to the criminal justice system. And I'm also a University of Maryland uh, alum. I got my degree in Soviet history in 1987 through the, uh, when I was in the army going to night school. Um, so that's my, my UM connection. Uh, but anyways, I was in prison and I uh, went to prison in Washington, 1987. I got out in 2003. And in 1990, I started Prison Legal News. And during the period of my incarceration, I was also active on pretty much every issue related to conditions of confinement and organizing <clears throat> that there is. And starting in the mid 90s um, is when I started having a growing awareness of kind of the environmental uh, issues within the prison system and uh, specifically things, the more basic things starting with water, then there was also asbestos in the older prisons. And we started reporting on this consistently starting in the mid nineties. And I'm pretty sure we were the first ones to start reporting on this. And we've kind of expanded our, our coverage on it. We've done a lot of investigative reporting and I kind of look at, um, you know, kind of the environmental impacts of, of prisons and mass incarceration, there's kind of a couple of them starting with, um, you know, the prison themselves, a source of toxic waste, as well as um, building the prisons on abandoned Superfund sites and on literally toxic waste dumps and, and that. And having been housed in uh, the prisons, that was kind of, um, you know, in some respects, it's stating the obvious when the water coming out of your faucet is brown in color and the guards are telling you it's perfectly fine. Um, so anyway, so that's my awareness around it. And I've been uh, writing about it and organizing around it uh, ever since. So uh, this is just one of the issues that, that I've been active on. But I think, we, I think uh, the Human Rights Defense Center and Prison Legal News have been kind of instrumental of kind of putting it on the map. Thank you so much for all of your introductions. I think it was a great way to get us 
um, to provide a little bit of background information on the topic, and then just to delve into that background a little bit further. Um, America, well, the United States has the achievement of having the highest incarcerated population in the world with 691 prisoners per capita. And additionally, when we look at the racial and ethnic makeup of US prison population, it's overwhelmingly non-white. Uh, so, and the trend is that although black people only make up 13% of the national population, black people are also 40% of the prison population. So incredibly disproportionate. And the trend is similar for other racial groups, including uh, Hispanic, Latinx, and Asian American populations, but to a less extreme extent. So how did we get here? Um, and if Jason and Paul, if you could provide us with some of this historical road mapping for like, how did we get to this point of mass incarceration as we know it? Okay. Um, you know, I always tend to look at these questions through Critical, critical race theory and historical perspectives, you know, CRT in these days, right? It's a touchy thing to, to talk about, but the mass incarceration, um, you know, as a tool of racialized social control, obviously came during the aftermath of slavery. And, you know, and we know Du Bois has written quite extensively on this as well as um, others. But during this period, during radical reconstruction, um, you know, white supremacists has lost, they lost control over the um, control of black bodies, could no longer use us as free labor. So they had to concoct a new system by which they could what? Compel us to go back to the same plantations from which we were just freed, right? Or at least allegedly freed, uh, was in their minds anywho. And, and this new system was the criminal justice system. And we put quotations around justice or just say the criminal legal system and using mechanisms such as pig's law, vagrancy laws, or any such law that they could use to accuse um, you know, a black of doing something wrong. Um, these were the mechanisms by which again, scores, hundreds of blacks were um, you know, mass incarcerated. And we're talking black men, black women, right? Kid, and even kids. And in these days, they didn't quite differentiate between, um, you know, gender, sexualities, things of that sort. So, for, or even age. So, you know, children were were mass incarcerated alongside adults as well. Um, you know, this is something to you know to think about when we think about the evilness of white supremacy and um, its marriage to anti-blackness, and, and in particularly in the aftermath of um, slavery. So the positionality of the prison today, in, in my view, is a direct result of the racist vitriol that white supremacy has always had against black bodies. And frankly, it's a visceral need to see black bodies in bondage, right? But also the commodification and dehumanization of our bodies almost as a necessity um, for white economic empowerment and power. Wow, that was... That was an amazing, absolutely amazing overview. And then Paul, do you have anything to add um, from your perspective on this question as well? Yes, I, I would say that uh, I come at this from, uh, you know, as the, the armchair Marxist here, and uh, that uh, primarily <clears throat> that, uh, you know, mass incarceration has been used as a tool of class control to control poor people. And I think that this is, you know, and I think that Yes, it's a component of white supremacy, but I think that when you start looking at parts of the United States that don't have large minority populations and you see that they've, uh, in car they've raised their prison population five, six, 700% in the last 40 years, and they're just locking up other white people. And, and I say this as one of the things that influenced my uh, view on this uh, kind of firsthand was I lived in Vermont for 10 years after I got out of prison and um, and I was the racial diversity in, in Vermont. I'm Mexican-American, and there's not a lot of people of color in Vermont. And um, But when you start looking at uh, the prison systems in places like Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, there's brutal, there's corrupt, um, there's terrible as they are everywhere else, and it's all white people. You know, there's, you're not seeing, um, you know, you're not seeing a lot of people of color in these places. And you still have this massive prison population uh, proportionate to the populations of, the, of those states and also the expansion uh, that they've seen. But, you know, I kind of take more of a state power analysis, I think, of the, um, you know, of, 
uh, of the American police state where we see you know, the massive rise of policing, the massive rise of criminalization, coupled with um, a prison system that's expanded by uh, five or 600% in the last 40 years as our primary tool of social control um, in this country. And I think the big thing is that pretty much everyone bearing the brunt of policing and prisons in this country, regardless of race, is poor. Um, I don't think anyone's claiming that uh, rich people of color are being herded into prison in vast numbers, just as you know, we're not seeing too many, uh, too many rich white people. And I think the most obvious one is if you look at wrongful convictions, it seems to be pretty much the exclusive province of the poor. Um, you know, there's not any, too many rich, rich people claiming to be wrongfully convicted of anything. So, um, so I think that's kind of, um, you know, the, I'd say that's my kind of nutshell version on it as well. Thank you so much. I think it's important to address that it's a race concern and a race topic and also socioeconomic as well. So we have to look at them together uh, because for situations like you mentioned, Baltimore, when there aren't people of color, it's still the poor that are being disproportionately incarcerated. Um, and I would like to open this question up. Anyone else on our panel would like to just briefly touch on some of the historic le legacy that have led us to experiencing environmental injustices and environmental racism inside of our prisons, jails, and detention centers. I would just um, like to add to what both Jason and Paul said that you know, we recognize that um, our prisons are, you know, essentially um, where failed policy um, shows itself, right? Prisons and hospitals. Um, except that I'm going to suggest that we talk about failed policies all the time, but we don't have the situations we have with respect to environmental issues and particularly with respect to poor people in prisons because of failed policies. I suggest we have these problems because of policies that are actually very successful. So when you have policies that are designed to keep poor people poor, no one should be surprised two or three generations down the road that you have poor people. And when you have policies that are designed to continue to create an upper class and a work class and to otherize people and to make sure um, that you have people who you can hire at a little or no uh, at cost, then again, you're, you should not be surprised that we're continually cycling people um, through uh, our prisons. These are the results of deliberate policy decisions and it's going to take deliberate policy decisions to undo them. Yeah, if I could just say a couple of things. I, I, I agree with everything that's been said, very important points um, in terms of inequality and particularly with respect to race and, and, and class. And, and yes, policies that have been deliberately designed um, to, to foment uh, oppression on folks. I mean, I think we should also point out at least in the United States that women are the single fastest growing population of folks who are incarcerated and uh, LGBTQ folks are also disproportionately, highly disproportionately impacted by this system. And we see a great deal of evidence that persons with disabilities, differently abled folks are targeted with a range of forms of violence from within this system. So, so it is truly an intersectionally oppressive system for sure. But I also just wanna point out that the movement for abolition has also been with us from the very beginning. Um, and, you know, I, I have not served time in, in prison, but, you know, have studied these movements. And mm -hmm. I was just reading a book the other day about the 1381 Peasant Rebellion in England. Um, my, my family is African American and, and white, the white side comes back from England. So part of my lineage um, goes back to the working class folks in England who, during that Peasant Rebellion in 1381, which was what, 640 years ago this month, People, two targets that people took down that, that first month were the Marshall Sea and the Fleet Prison. They literally tore those prisons to the ground and freed the prisoners inside, who, were, by the way, were debtor uh, prisoners. Um, so folks who were working off so-called debts that had been imposed on them by the system. Then we can look at Bastille Day, which was about tearing down 
a, a prison, a symbol of oppression, empire, et cetera. That's just across the pond to say nothing of what we've done here. So the bad news is, of course, is we've had imprisonment and incarceration for generations. The good news is, is we've had abolitionist movements for just as long and very diverse, if I might say. I would also love to add one thing. Um, yeah, I totally agree with every point that's been made, really crucial. Um, I guess with regards to the historical roadmap, I would just want to add that the, the rise of human caging was and still is inseparable from the actual settling of this land and the foundation of the US. So not only did there was there a transition from chattel slavery to convict leasing to incarceration as we know it today, um, but also we have to think about how in order to extract resources from this land, in order to settle this land, indigenous people had to be forcibly removed and often ca caged. Um, and if folks want to read more about that, there's a really good book called City of Inmates by Kelly Hernandez. Um, and also like David Pella was saying, um, it's important to recognize like all of the historical rebellions and resilience um, that has continued in response to this and uh, Kelly Hernandez does a really good job of laying that out. So just wanted to offer that recommendation. Thank you all so much for those responses. It was amazing to hear that the historical context, which I think is so important in grounding us in the way we understand any topic and see how we got to where we are. Because often what we see today is just a manifestation of a previous or currently still existing oppression. So it's all interconnected. Um, and on to our next question. The nation's incarceration epidemic is undoubtedly a social issue, but many may be unaware of how this intersects with environmental justice. Um, so I would appreciate if David and uh, May, May could, <laughs> could, lay out, could lay this out for us. I know we've talked about it a little bit um, earlier in terms of like where prisons are cited uh, not having access to clean drinking water inside of prisons, but if you could just talk a little bit more in detail about some of the other injustices that are experienced by people who are incarcerated or detained. Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. And um, just wanna point out and, and give big props to, to, to Mr. Wright, uh, who you know is director of the Human Rights Defense Center and their, their amazing publication, Prison Legal News, to my knowledge, the number one most read publication in carceral spaces in the United States really, really has been doing this work from the very beginning. So I, I really take my cues uh, from, from him and his organization. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we see prisons, jails, uh, so-called detention centers as spaces of environmental and climate risks. As has been said, water contamination, air pollution. We also see like valley fever and other diseases cropping up in many of these spaces, uh, extreme heat and cold, which of course has been amplified by human driven climate uh, disruption, flooding risks. We also see forced labor in hazardous occupations, including uh, firefighting. Um, and of course, technological and disaster cleanups like the BP uh, Deep Horizon oil spill and a whole slew of, of hurricane disaster aftermaths where folks are paid little or nothing for doing very, very hazardous work. Um, but more broadly we, and deeply, we see um, inadequate medical care. We see poor nutrition. We see, um, you know, carceral facilities and that impact not only human health negatively, but non-human health. Uh, as was stated earlier, these are also sites where hazardous waste itself and climate change um, inducing gases, greenhouse gases are actually being uh, produced. We also see carceral spaces as significant generators of waste like sewage and hazardous chemicals. So in other words, they themselves are sites of the production of environmental threats. And I would argue are inherently sites of environmental injustice because they require the subjugation of marginalized peoples and they produce harm to our ecosystems as a matter of course. Um, and so uh, the last thing I would say is in my field um, where there is this, this obsession with explaining away environmental racism as people of color moving into already polluted neighborhoods. We call this the minority move-in hypothesis. Well, that's been disproven by a whole slew of empirical studies, um, but what is obvious to anybody who studies jails and prisons and detention centers 
is that incarcerated folks have very little, if any, choice as to where they're going to be housed, where they will reside. So the idea of the so-called minority move-in hypothesis is completely moot. Uh, folks are forced to live in places that are inherently toxic. So those are some, some things I'm looking at. Yeah, David really laid it out. Um, there's there's so many ways to answer this question. Um, I could say so many different statistics and data and examples, um, but I think there's a couple points that I would really like to focus on. One part that gets um, under-recognized, I think, is the ways that the carceral system is used as a frontline tool to repress um, land defense and ecological defense. So for example, um, people who are, are fighting against clear cutting or fighting pipelines, um, policing and um, the incarceration system and the threat of it is used to repress um, anti-extractive activities. So for example, like Jessica Reznicek, who is, uh, was just sentenced to eight years due to actions against the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, and that also connects to the ways that people experience repression on the inside. And um, in answering this question, I really want us to deconstruct this binary between environmental justice and social justice. I really believe that like everywhere that we exist as humans are our environments. Those are habitats. These are places where we drink water, where we eat, where we live. These are environments. And so um, I'd like to read directly from um, a letter that was written to folks in FTP by an incarcerated comrade named uh, Nakechi, Clinton Nakechi Walker. Um, it's just a couple paragraphs, if that's all right. Um, he really describes like what the elemental conditions inside are. Um, so he says this, the elemental conditions in prison in their own right are toxicogenic and producing toxic components and poisons within the atmosphere. These elements breed emotional dejection, conjuring frustration at having to breathe spawns of black mold and dust filled air. Asbestos is regularly found in the dark bowels of the most ancient of penitentiary structures, while its captives are made to drink water that's under or over treated out of necessity. The swarm of toxins allow no exception to the prison food either. It's a kind of service where one may find rodent excretion on trays and utensils, roaches peppered on any given meal, and a mouthful of clotted milk if a mistake is made if of not sniff testing before consumption. Those acts are hostile to the psyche and harmful to the health. This poisonous atmosphere produced by malignant activities within DOC septics is constantly introduced into the quarters of men and women and capable of negatively inducing the psyche's antibodies, which protect the spirit of its captives. In some, the prison system and its toxins produce depression, anxiety, dependence, destruction, hopelessness, helplessness, irritation, frustration, aggression, suicide, and many other nouns related to such. And there's a lot more to this um, letter. I'll paste it in the chat for everyone um, because I think this excerpt really is just a, a little bit of what, um, what it's like and, and the ways that the environment of prisons are toxins and are a front line of social injustice and environmental injustice. Um, so sending that here for everyone to read in the future. Thank you so much for reading that excerpt. I think it's important to address that these injustices are like environmental. Also people experience like negative health impacts in, like physically and mentally from being in a space like this. So it's really like, as everyone has mentioned before, like so interconnected. So I really appreciate um, you for bringing that to us and making sure that we had that as part of our conversation. And as we're talking about these prisons being located and built on these hazardous sites like brownfields and uh, super fun sites and the exposure to unsafe drinking water, mold, heat conditions, as some prisons don't have heating in the winter and cooling in the summer, um, the local residents are often warned about these hazards, whereas the people who are incarcerated in those spaces are not. So it's touching on like who gets to be part of what is the community and like who has those claims to saying they're experiencing environmental injustice. Um, 
So that's something that I would like for us to explore even further, like why are communities notified of what's going in there in their areas sometimes not even all the time our communities notified but even less so for the people who are experiencing those negative impacts inside of that carceral space um, and then what can we do to eliminate these toxic prisons and make sure that people's basic needs are being met while incarcerated or if anyone should be incarcerated at all um, so we'll get started uh, i'll start with paul Yes, I, I think that, you know, in a lot of respects, I think that, uh, you know, Terry's comments about so much of what we're stuck with now being a, a policy decision, I think is, it really understates the issue because I think uh, the first decision uh, is deciding to criminalize so much behavior that leads to caging uh, over 2 million people. Then the next decision is if you're going to cage people, where are you going to build those cages? And that policy decision was made in the 1990s when the United States built uh, around 1800 prisons in the 1990s. The US was opening roughly one prison every two weeks uh, around the country. And these were mostly medium and maximum security prisons. They're virtually all built in remote rural areas. And a lot of them were built on these uh, toxic sites. But I think it's also worth noting that you know the decisions beyond building these prisons in rural areas far from the urban areas that <clears throat> most prisoners are from a lot of the decisions were made to actually worsen uh these these conditions like such as in the south florida texas louisiana they've made the conscious decisions to build prisons with no air conditioning for example to you know to literally immiserate and and uh and, and torment the people uh, inside them. And I say this as somebody who lives in Florida, and like I couldn't imagine being in prison in Florida with no air conditioning. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, we also see this on the West Coast, um, uh, all the prisons between San Diego and Alaska that are built in seismic zones. And I say this, I was in prison twice in Washington State when we had earthquakes, once in 1996 and once in uh, the year 2000. In 1996, I was locked in in a cell at the Washington State Reformatory is 8.30 at night. And we had around a, a six, uh, level six earthquake and the guards ran away and left us all locked in our cells. Um, and fortunately no one was injured, but chunks of concrete were falling off the, uh, off the ceiling. And this was a, built, a brick built structure that at the time was almost 90 years old. So, you know, so we, we see a lot of these decisions of, you know, each decision compounds itself worse, but I, more and leads to a worse outcome. And I also think that, you know, we're seeing this now, I think, with climate change uh, leading to extreme weather events. Um, you know, we see this, for example, when prisons are in wildfire zones. Uh, we've seen this with hurricanes, starting with Hurricane Katrina. Um, and then we've had more recent hurricanes. And one of the things that I find uh, pretty incredible about this is that with all these natural disasters uh, where, which are affecting prisons that the government choose to build in dangerous locations. And as a general rule, prison officials, they don't evacuate the prisons. It's just, let's lock everything down and hope for the best. And the amazing thing is they've been, I think, rather lucky but this is also the thing too, I think it shows the callous disregard that they have, not just for the lives of the prisoners who don't have a choice here, but also that of their staff as, um, you know, prisons are smack dab in the middle of wildfires, uh, hurricanes, and these are by definition avoidable, Yeah, you know, they're known and avoidable um, uh, incidents. And then we've also got the, um, as I mentioned earlier, and as uh, Faith mentioned as well, is the siting of prisons on Superfund sites. I mean, these are toxic waste um, sites. They're highly contaminated in California, for example, one prison in Kern County. There's very high levels of arsenic in the water, which is a known carcinogen, and of course it's poisonous. And we see so many other prisons that are built on um, abandoned, uh, there's an immigration facility in Washington State, the Northwest Detention Center, which is built on an abandoned uh, Asarco aluminum smelter, which is highly contaminated. And you see this you know, time after time after time around the country. The Federal Bureau of Prisons uh, ADX Supermax prison, the so-called most secure prison in America. 
uh, is built on an abandoned uranium mine. Um, and we see this especially in states that have, that have had a lot of mining activity like Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, where the land has been thoroughly poisoned by years or decades of mining activity. And it's almost like, okay, what are we gonna do with it now? And someone has the brilliant idea of, let's build a prison on here. And in some government circles, this is viewed as land reuse or they, and they, they actually pat themselves on the back thinking that, um, you know, that this is a really good thing to do when they're endangering the lives of both the prisoners and the staff that are, um, that are incarcerated and work in these prisons. And the kind of the more amazing thing though, is that we see very little pushback within the government on any of this. Uh, here in Florida, the panhandle uh, around four or five years ago, a jail flooded. Um, the flooding in the jail caused the heaters or the dryers in the prison in the jail laundry room to break free, which caused the gas leak, which caused an explosion, which pretty much destroyed the jail. It killed two people and injured dozens of others. And when the time came to rebuild the jail, they literally built it on the same floodplain across the street from the old jail. And only one, only one uh, city council member objected to this and thought that was a bad idea. And, and I think that, you know, kind of the recurring theme that we see through all this is, um, you know, the active uh, role of the government in all these decisions where they've kind of normalized and made um, the use of toxic land, environmental hazards, they've made it commonplace and the norm with regards to American prisons and jails. And at least at the government level, you know, we, we're seeing rising concern, I think about this among academics, among activists, uh, prisoners themselves, and you know, across the board as well as with the media, but the government is seemingly oblivious to all this. And we also see this at the regulatory level where the environmental agencies that are tasked with enforcing this nation's environmental laws pretty much refuse to do anything about those same environmental laws when the people impacted are prisoners. That was a really robust um, response. So I just wanna thank you for really like giving us the, the details for what's going on and the fact that our government is not doing enough. And I would just like to pivot and kind of like combine this question with the next question, um, given that we do have Delegate Terry Hill here on our panel. Um, so maybe she can speak a little bit more to some of the legal opportunities and challenges for why some of these conditions haven't changed. And uh, I think it's in the, the same vein. I know that um, in Maryland, you had proposed a bill earlier um, to provide like more plant-based options in those carceral spaces to help try and bring some of that equity back into that place, if that's even possible with the system that we have today. So to combine two questions sort of into one, like what is our pathway forward in terms of using legal opportunities, if you could touch on that, Delegate Hill. Sure, I, I think the first thing um, that we have to do is recognize that um, despite the fact that we're talking about human beings, despite the fact that 85% of imprisoned people will come back to the communities, we see as a society, people in prisons as disposable. And everything that May and Paul and David uh, and Jason have run down about where we choose to put our prisons, um, uh, the environmental impacts within the prisons, the decision to put people in a cell that is smaller than my bathroom and tell them that that's their living facility with a toilet right there, right? No circulating air, no air conditioning, inadequate heat, um, and all the other things that the other uh, panelists have described so well. It is a statement about how we don't value these folks. So until we accept that truth and face that, talking about real changes is like, you know, knocking your head up against the wall because um, we don't value their lives, okay? So I think that's the first thing is to call it out as this, um, as this discussion today is doing and to say it louder and more often. 
I, um, and, and challenge um, not just folks in government, but the society as a whole to take a look at what we're doing and, and to question it and make us face why we're doing it. So um, again, everything to me is a public health issue. And for me, if we're talking, you know, from a, from a policy standpoint, you almost have to explain to people why you're gonna save them money, right? To achieve any real change because they're not gonna do it out of the goodness of their hearts, okay? They're gonna do it because there's some economic benefit. And whenever you can, you know, do preventive medicine, you're saving money in the long run. So I think that what we look at are um, talking about these environmental challenges, talking about the impact on the prisoners, talking about how that costs the taxpayers money because the taxpayers support the health care that supports the prisoners, right? And talk about how that impacts our communities upon their reentry into society. And, and it's kind of working sort of that, you know, what is it that, that, that will get their ear? Money. And so tying the economic impact uh, is much more power into what's going on is much more powerful than simply saying this is wrong and it's unethical. Um, and I think that's really the direction that we need to, to, to be going in. And again, it is a matter of sort of reimagining what we're doing. Are we really talking about rehabilitation? Or are we talking about just punishment and putting people out of sight, right? Which is what we've done. If we're talking about rehabilitation, there are just so many levels. Um, uh, but again, why are people not housed in rooms and spaces where they can actually stretch and move about? Why are we serving them food that, as, as May read, you know, is not only grossly contaminated, but is generally unhealthy, right? Um, why are we not giving them options? Why are we allowing them to develop hepatitis and diabetes and heart disease and hypertension uh, rather than you know, provide the diet and the environment and the um, supports that can actually prevent those things from occurring. Um, so it's, it's, it's stupid thinking, but, but it's so inbred into how we view and how we folks and how we otherize folks and how we scapegoat folks um, that, that you, you, you have to go about making the change indirectly or making the arguments from, from a whole nother um, point, in my opinion. Thank you for, for that. And I would just like to ask if David, Jason, and May could briefly touch on um, some other approaches, maybe some grassroots strategies for abolition, abolition of this system so that we don't have this carceral space. And especially, I think that's important given that We've talked about like the state, like this is state sanctioned violence against black and brown and poor people. So I don't think at all times we can necessarily rely on the state to reverse its own violence against its, against the people living there. So what would that look like and how can we move forward? Um, and yeah, and just how can we move forward? So if, Jason, if you wanted to start us off. Yeah, yeah, I loved everything Dr. Hill had to say. Um, I think it's it's very much so snatching back that narrative. You know, unfortunately, as a society, we have been ideologically programmed to sort of see the prison and those within it as disposable, right? And in this view, therefore, the prison and its inhabitants is a waste dump anyway, right? So we ought not be concerned about what's happening in there um, and the poisons that are floating amongst the people. Um, you know, Dr. Hill spoke about the communicable diseases, but then also the uh, non-communicable diseases. And I think that ought to be the reframing of the prison as a epidemiological nightmare. Um, and we have to also point out the, flaw, the fatal error, frankly. Uh, we saw this with COVID in particular, that society makes when we think of prisons as a faraway spectacle, because the vast majority of those within these prisons are coming home. And if they are in there being fed poison or um, with regards, for instance, with the communicable uh, diseases, that means these things are going to come home. 
and they are going to plague the community, right? And so in this view then, the prison as an epidemiological nightmare is something that could potentially be knocking on your door soon. And so this is how alongside with the economic argument that Dr. Hill was talking about, we have to also begin to bolster this up as a public health nightmare because it, because frankly it is. But I think too, we can't lose sight of the racialized, the gendered, the classed components of this, right? We can't miss that because again, the racial disparity, all of those identifiers that I mentioned there, the disparities are also present that shows these distinctions and, and those matter as well. And, and to go back to what you mentioned too, Faith, with, with, with regards to the, cruel, the cruelty of this, it is an Eighth Amendment violation. You know, states are priding themselves nowadays on getting rid of death row, you know, the death penalty, but they are still effectively and efficiently killing people. Because if I have to sit in this cell and, uh, and eat food with animal droppings in it and, and, and drink arsenic-based uh, water and inhale ash, uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're effectively killing me. I am on death row. And so th these, are, these are ways in which grassroots organizations, and many of them are doing this type of work, um, you know, can take a hold of that narrative and, and sort of rebirth the prison as an institution that ought not be in existence. I think that's the only way in which to move forward is to is to frankly abolish this institution that is just so egregiously dangerous. It, 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 it is a danger to public health and public safety. Thank you for that and mentioning the system as a as the danger that it is to to, to everyone. And then May, if you would like to touch on this too, I know that you're involved in grassroots efforts right now as well. As of many of the other panelists too. Yeah, thank you. Um, again, there's so much to say um, with, with the Campaign to Fight Toxic Prisons, which is the formation that I'm organizing in, we really, um, our work is directly driven by folks on the front lines, folks who are currently and formerly incarcerated. And we put our energy into altering their material conditions. So we don't put a lot of our energy into like working with policymakers or even working with academics or um, these top down methods. We really uh, mobilize grassroots people on the bottom and um, through people power, through applying pressure to those policymakers. That's how we, that's how we get shit done. Um, and so just to give a few examples, um, like I really appreciate that Paul Wright mentioned um, that these impacts of hurricanes on incarcerated people are preventable. And, and through four or five years of fight toxic prisons, trying to draw media attention, um, just general social attention to how people get left behind. We've now seen starting in, I believe 2019 that some facilities were actually starting to evacuate. So for example, last year we saw uh, TDCJ posting videos on Twitter of them evacuating even before we said anything. Um, and the year before that, um, we were able to get within 16 hours of mobilizing thousands of people to call these facilities demanding evacuation, we were able to get people actually evacuated. And so I just say this to underscore that we don't necessarily need policymakers to be to be making those large decisions, like in the long run, maybe yes we do, but in immediate crisis times, we've been able to push for actual material change for people inside. Um, so that's that's been one huge part of our work. Um, and there are times where, where we do work with policy. I think a good example is in Texas. Um, folks on the panel have described many times the extreme heat, the lack of air conditioning, um, in Texas, 75% of prisons don't have AC. There's very little, vent there's little to no ventilation. Um, and there's a group there that we're involved with called Texas Prison Condition Advocates. Um, and they've been advocating for this bill, the House Bill 1971, which is basically created to divert funding from prison construction in Texas and use that to put air conditioning in existing prisons. And so this is an example of what we would call like an abolitionist reform or an abolitionist policy where we're actually able to take money away from creating new prisons and put them into improving the basic needs and livability of folks who are currently incarcerated. 
Um, and then finally, I think that the way that we get people's needs met, the way that we get people healthy, if we're going to talk about public health, is to free people and to stop building new prisons, to halt, halt active construction that's going on. And so we've been able to support the um, stopping of construction of four prisons so far. Um, a, a couple stories that I wanna share, one of them is the struggle in Letcher County, Kentucky, which I know Paul was more involved in than I was. So I just wanna that's give it. a shout out to Paul. We, we put it on the map and helped lead the struggle there, which was actually successful. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so um, in Letcher County, it was supposed to be the largest federal prison in US history. They wanted to build this on a former coal mine next to an active coal slurry pond, um, a, a mile and a half from an active slurry pond and a mile and a half from an old growth forest. And so a combination of local organizers, national grassroots organizers, environmentalists who are trying to defend the forest and 21 incarcerated people Oh, sorry, correcting myself. It's the most expensive, not the largest federal prison. Um, it was supposed to be $510 million. Um, but yeah, a combination of local grassroots organizing and 21 incarcerated people who filed a lawsuit, we were able to stop that construction. Um, more recently, there are three private prisons, uh, pri mega men's prisons in Alabama that the governor of Alabama has been pushing and working with uh, local formation called Communities Not Prisons, we've been able to completely destroy the public funding for that um, by targeting the underwriters of the bonds. And so I just explain all of this to, yeah, again, to underscore that there's so many different tactics and strategies and different formations of grassroots organizing um, that can work successfully with policy, but don't need to because we're able to apply pressure from the bottom and from the outside. So, Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. I think that was that was a really lovely response. We're getting close to the end of our session, so I do want to have some time to take questions from the audience. So I have a question that was sent to me in the chat, and it says, could you all direct us to some literature on this topic? I think we as physicians and other healthcare workers are not often aware of the hazards faced by this population, and we need to be much more cognizant of these issues. So in response to that, if you have like any journal articles, you could either send them. Uh, you all have my email, and I know on Google there's different channels, so I can set up a channel and make sure that all of this gets sent there. If you know any of the titles, you can just go ahead and like type them into the chat um, and just talk about like some really pivotal literature that would help better understand um, this topic. So I don't know. Um, David, you haven't had a chance to talk in a while, so if you wanted to mention some literature, if you know any. Uh, sure, yeah, I see um, we've got the Fight Toxic Prisons uh, website. I would definitely check out, oh, thank you, Paul. Uh, Prison Legal News is just, you know, chock full of extraordinary, extraordinary reporting on this and good primary sources. Uh, and I see Paniyoti Sulkos <laughs> uh, has, uh, oh yeah, there's a, uh, if you've got insomnia, you know, check out that book by David Pello. Um, yeah, there, there's there's a, a burgeoning literature out there. There's also Robert Perdue, uh, who's um, at uh, Elon, I think, uh, University, who's done a lot of this good stuff. Feel free to send me an email, and I can share some some good sources with you. Thank you. And then, do we have any more questions in the chat um, for our panelists? If anyone wants to type anything really quick, I know that there's been a ton of information and hopefully everyone has had an amazing experience at our panels and sometimes it can be hard to think of questions on the spot. Um, <laughs> so I definitely understand. Um, I'd like to add but, something here is I think yeah. that one of the things is all too often I think a lot of people um, feel overwhelmed and powerless about confronting the American police state just because it's so vast it has so much, it seems to have so much power and it's so destructive. And, but one of the things I'd say about one of the things about the environmental uh, impacts of mass incarceration, in a lot of respects, this is a really underexplored topic. I mean, I'd say the prison legal news has been kind of at the forefront of kind of putting this on the map uh, media wise and also, you know, kind of activist wise, but that said, we've only scratched the surface and just because we don't have the resources 
to do it. I think this is one of the things that people at their local level um, can find out, you know, and a lot of this is just information that people have locally. And this is because, you know, we don't have any type of like national clearinghouse or repository for this information. But it's one of those things when I talk to local activists and, you know, we start talking about this stuff and they're like, oh yeah, everyone knows that uh, where they're building that new prison, that it was the, you know, back in the day, they were using it as an oil refinery um, or, and, you know, it's all contaminated. That's why they couldn't sell the land and that's why they built the prison there. And that's the type of thing that um, really needs to be kind of put out there. One of the things too is, is uh, that we didn't really touch on uh, so far on the panel is in the 1990 with the wind down of the Cold War, uh, you know, dozens if not hundreds of military bases were decommissioned. And one of the things that happened was, you know, decades of using these bases for military purposes, the land was contaminated with everything from fuel to ammunition, uh, to chemical weapons, and you name it, they couldn't find anything to do with it. So they built a bunch of prisons. I mean, for folks dealing with the Federal Bureau of Prisons, Fort Dix, New Jersey, that used to be an infantry base, Fort Devens, Massachusetts, that used to be a military base, uh, Victorville in California. These were all military bases that were deemed to be too contaminated and too toxic to use for anything else, any type of commercial or civilian purpose that they decided to repurpose them as prisons. And there's, still, there's so much that's out there that frankly, we just don't know. And, and that's one of those things for folks that are looking for projects who like to research stuff. This is stuff that people can do locally. And of course there's jails. I mean, every community has a jail. And as we're seeing with a lot of the stuff, as I mentioned the jail and the panhandle here in Florida that's on the floodplain, uh, these are jails in urban centers and they're teeming with all kinds of toxic and environmental problems. And these are in your community, right where people live. Um, so, you know, so I think that's one of those things when you, you're starting to wonder what can I do or, you know, stuff like that. There is stuff you can do. And, and usually it's right there in your community. You don't have to go 500 miles or whatever. It's usually a couple miles from where you're living. So I, I just wanted to throw that out there. I think that's a really important point. Um, there's always this issue of scale. And I think sometimes when we take things to even a statewide scale, a national scale, it can be really overwhelming and it becomes a lot easier to feel defeated. But by starting in your own community and really tapping in with what's happening in your own backyard, um, you can make like some of those meaningful changes that actually impact the, the daily lives of your community members. Um, and we do have another question in the chat, just really quickly before we run out of time. It says, what has been the uptake of prison environmental justice issues in the broader environmentalism and climate activism and climate change activism? So we've talked about sort of where environmental justice and the environmental justice movement and the prison abolition movement sit together, but um, just taking it out to like even the environmental justice movement is sort of a subset of the mainstream environmental movement. Um, so are these issues being addressed in the mainstream environmental movement? Um, and what does that look like if anyone on our panel would like to jump in on that question? I'd like to hear what others have to say, but I'll just say my experiences as far as the so-called mainstream environmental movement is, it's not getting much traction at all. And I used to, when we first started doing uh, this work around prison ecology and, and stuff like that, I thought, well, you know what? regardless of what anyone's uh, views on criminal justice or sentencing issues are or prison abolition, no one wants feces in their drinking water. And that turned out to be a very naive viewpoint because as it turned out, we did a big story uh, around five or six years ago about how the Washington Department of Corrections was literally dumping uh, raw sewage into people's drinking water in the Snohomish River. And the interesting thing was there's around five or six environmental groups in that county where this is happening. And we reached out to all the environmental groups asking if they had a statement about the Department of Corrections dumping feces into their drinking water. No one would comment on the record uh, about this. And when I asked them, how come? You're supposed to be environmentalists. Why are you okay with literally having shit put into your community's drinking water by the government? And they're like, well, the prison's the biggest employer here. and We don't wanna alienate people who are gonna think we're anti-jobs if we demand that the Department of Corrections do something about the feces in our drinking water. So my, my takeaway from this is that 
people are against feces in their drinking water unless it's the government putting it there. And, and I think that I think this is also one of the things too. And I, I don't want to make too many broad-based assumptions or stereotypes or whatever. But it seems like a lot of the mainstream environmental movement in this country is, for lack of a better term, kind of white and kind of bourgeois. And those are very different issues than the things that are affecting uh, people locked in cages. Many of us who are disproportionately, as I mentioned earlier, I think we're all poor, nearly all poor, and we're disproportionately people of color. And I think this comes to a mindset too, where a lot of people in the mind, in the mainstream environmental movement, I think they tend to view the government as part of the solution. And when it comes to the police state in America, the government's the problem. It's the government putting me in a cage, it's the government putting a gun to my head and a boot on my neck and making me drink feces in the drinking water that they put there. And the government is squarely the problem here and they're not the solution. They don't enforce their own laws around the environment, for example. And I think a lot of people outside of, uh, you know, a lot of people in the mainstream environmental justice movement, they have a hard time getting their heads around this, the fact that the government might be part of the problem here. And, you know, and I think that leads to the inaction ar around these, but maybe I'm wrong and other people have a different take on it. If so, I'd love to hear it. Thank you so much. We have um, only four minutes left. So if each panelist could just take maybe uh, 30, 45 seconds to address this, uh, this question as well. That would be amazing. And then we can just start with uh, Delegate Hill. I, um, I don't actually remember what the, what the question, I think the question was about, um, Longer does the, the prison uh, environmental justice movement sit in the larger frame of yeah. the environmental movement? So I think, I mean, you know, Paul said it, and people, we, we've already established the fact that people in prisons, not only the, the people who are sent there um, to be incarcerated, but people who work there are essentially considered, you know, disposable. So the environmental movement has not really picked up on this as a critical issue, although it is for all the reasons that we've described over this last hour. Um, and, um, and that will continue until it becomes personal. So we know, for instance, when we talk about, you know, this, this change in perspective on dealing with drug addiction, it was when it was no longer those black and brown people who were drug addicts, because when they were drug addicts, that was clearly a moral uh, uh, turpitude issue. And, and, and they needed to be set aside because there was something wrong with them when it came back to suburban white, even when it was in rural white poor communities, nobody much cared. But when it came on their own doorstep, um, the power structure decided that maybe this is a public health issue after all. And maybe we should take a public health approach to try and help people get better. It's the same thing here. It has to impact people personally, um, particularly when we've, you know, our society has been conditioned um, to think of certain people as being completely disposable and, uh, and unimportant. Thank you so much. And then, um, Jason, if you wanted to go really quickly. Uh, I, I was just thinking about the interest in romance that some people have within the broader uh, movement, but even outside um, with the use of prison labor with combating the fires. Right. Um, so probably, um, you know, the need to problematize that a little bit more as well. But I think everybody has said everything that I would say, but problematizing that romance there a little bit more. Right. Like it's OK for them to go out into these into the forest and into the woods and, and with the smoke inhalation and so forth under the guise of building skill sets that they wouldn't otherwise be able to use anyway once released. Mm -hmm. But, you know, yeah. That's that's a great perspective. And a lot of those jobs where people say they're building skills um, are actually legally able to discriminate against formerly incarcerated persons. So they're doing the work for a little to no wage, their wages can be garnished. And then when they get out, they are discriminated against in that same field for which they develop skills, allegedly. And but, Big yeah. Greens do that as well. And let me just, I just want to but let me just add, since that was brought up in some of the topics I was thinking about earlier, so I'm glad you got it in there. That is also a job that has huge um, risk 
for Carson, uh, for cancer and other kinds of health issues where, where firefighters who are not in prison people are fighting every day to get um, health benefits through workers' compensation for the damage that they do to their bodies in order to do that job. So of course it's an appropriate job for us to give to prisoners while they- Oh do. yeah, and, it, and it's coercive, right? You know, you're forcing them to do that. You know, even if you're giving them a penny, two dot, whatever the wage, which we know is not, not the same as a, um, a professional on the outside. It's coercive, no matter how you put it. But I guess it's okay if it's under the guise of fighting climate change, you know? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things worth pointing out is the irony of this is you've got prisoners being paid like a dollar a day to risk their lives and give their lives. I mean, a lot of prisoner firefighters are being killed every year, and they're literally giving their lives for for a pittance to defend the house, to protect the houses of billionaires. And, you know, it may sound crazy here, but I say, hey, let the billionaires pay for their own fire protection if they want to build houses in dangerous areas. Or put on a suit and fight the fire. That's really crazy talk. <laughs> it is, it is. Uh, and we're at the end of our time. So David, May, if you just wanted to lead us with like a few concluding thoughts to, to wrap up our session. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just say everything that was just said about firefighting um, is absolutely right. But in the state of California, we successfully fought to get legislation to remove those key barriers for formerly incarcerated folks who've been firefighting so they can move into that career. We'll see how well that works out. The last thing I'll say is in terms of the mainstream environmental movement and the uptake of this issue, absolutely agree with what has been said. They've been virtually mostly useless, uh, but it has been with the BIPOC led Green New Deal movement where we have seen folks, including here in my region, in the central coast of California, building Green New Deal frameworks that address these problems of the prison industrial complex, creating career pathways for formerly incarcerated folks to get opportunities in key industries like renewable energy, like cannabis, tourism, and reducing our jail population and defunding the police. So there are efforts where these two things are coming together around policy as well. Thank you. And then May? Yeah, thank you. I, everything that's been said resonates. Um, I would just want folks to know that this is pretty much exactly what we do as Fight Toxic Prisons, is bring these issues to environmental movements. We offer trainings and workshops um, and convene. We host an annual convergence to convene prison abolitionists and environmental activists and, act and academics. And um, I think it's really crucial to forefront the voices of incarcerated people in environmental spaces and for, um, for them to hear directly from people inside. And um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. I just wanna thank our beautiful panel today for bringing such an important topic to the forefront. I've been looking forward to this panel session. Um, since the beginning of summer. Like I wanted to bring more inter intersectional perspectives to this symposium. And this was one of the panels that I was strongly advocating, like this needs to be present. We need to be talking about this more. So I'm glad that it came into fruition and was just such a meaningful and beneficial um, presentation with our panelists, at least, at least for me, that's, that's my takeaway. Um, and this session was recorded and it will be posted on YouTube later on. Um, and we'll make sure to give that to the member, to the panelists to share. Um, and it'll also be available for anyone else who would like to watch. So just look out for the Siege Lab um, YouTube page and all of our panel sessions will be recorded and posted there. Uh, so thank you so much. Like I said, my email is in the chat. If anyone wants to talk, I think most, I think all of our panelists also put their contact information in the chat as well. So please, please feel free to reach out to, to any of us. This was, this was amazing. Thank you all for attending and thank you to the panelists for being a part of this experience. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Have a blessed day.